and he reunited the princes in the tower and he wasn't planning on letting them go anytime soon or maybe even ever. Hi everyone, I'm back. Uh, I know it's been 9 or maybe even 10 months since I did a video the last time. Sorry for that, but uh, Corona virus really makes everything a little bit harder. Anyway, I'm back and this time I want to talk about England and something that happened during the medieval time. And it's about something that happened during the Wars of the Roses. If you want to know more about the Wars of the Roses, I'm not gonna cover it entirely in this video because it's uh, really a lot of information. So if you want to know more, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll make a series about it. And I'm also gonna finish the Myths of the Sea. But I want to do several things and I already started writing this one so I wanted to finish that first. And I think it's a very interesting topic and I hope you guys like it as well. Let's start. The Wars of the Roses were a series of English civil wars for control over the throne of England. They were fought between supporters of two royal houses. One of them was the Royal House of Plantagenet, also known as the Red Rose or the Lancasters. And the other house was the House of York, which was known as the White Rose. So the Red and the White Rose were against each other. The wars lasted from 1455 until 1487, so 32 years, 3 weeks and 4 days to be exact. And the subject is, of course, as you can see in the title, the princes in the tower. And who were the princes in the tower? They were the sons of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. And Edward married Elizabeth against the will of his advisors. Uh, she wasn't really from a great family. She was also a widow and she had two sons. So it wasn't really ideal for politics. And Elizabeth was known for her beauty. So Edward was of course very much in love with her. It is even said that she was the most beautiful queen England had ever had. And Edward was also known as a very handsome man and also very charismatic. However, Edward lost his throne in October 1470, but he won it back in 1471. Edward would remain king until his death in 1483, but it wasn't easy. He struggled for 22 years to establish his rule. His wife Elizabeth outlived him and she died in 1492. Together they had 10 children that we know of. They had 7 daughters and 3 sons. And one of their sons died when he was only 2 years old like so many other children back then. And two of their daughters died as well before they could reach adulthood. And now they only had two other boys, Edward and Richard, the heir and the spare. And Edward was the long-awaited heir to the throne. They already had a few daughters and when Edward was born they were very happy because boys had a stronger claim to the throne. Luckily that isn't the case anymore, but back then it was boys before girls. No woman had ever successfully claimed the throne of England. And all the advisors and nobles at court were also men, so they really wouldn't want to listen to a woman, which is really stupid, but okay. Edward was born on November the 2nd, 1470 at Cheney Gates, which was the medieval house of the Abbot of Westminster, adjoining Westminster Abbey. His mother, the Queen Elizabeth Woodville, has sought sanctuary there. His father was deposed and the Lancastrian supporters wanted to capture the Queen and her children. Eventually, Edward IV recaptured his throne and young Edward became the Prince of Wales in June 1471. He also became the Earl of Pembroke. He lived in Ludlow Castle and was under the supervision of the brother of Queen Elizabeth Woodville, Anthony Woodville and he also had his own household. And he was also engaged to Anne, the daughter of the Duke of Brittany. They would marry upon their majority, but he never reached his majority. And Richard was born on the 17th of August 1473 in Shrewsbury. He was created Duke of York in May 1474. The following year he would be made Knight of the Garter and Order of Chivalry. He was also created Earl of Nottingham on the 12th of June 1476. When he was about four years old, he was married to the five-year-old Anne de Mowbray, 8th Countess of Norfolk. 
He also became Duke of Norfolk and Earl of Reen on the 7th of February 1477 because Anne could not inherit it after her father died since she was a girl. Unfortunately, Anne would die in November 1481 when she was only 8 years old and all her belongings would actually go to her family members but the parliament passed an act to give all her estates to Richard. On the 9th of April 1483 the king died when the princes were only 9 and 12 years old. Their father had finally restored a measure of stability and he also made sure that the boys were trained the past 10 years. Edward was trained in the marches of Ludlow to become king and of course Richard was trained to become a very important lord. But Edward IV's death was very unexpected which made their position very vulnerable. Luckily the king was well enough to make some changes in his will before he died. He made his brother who was also named Richard protector of the realm which means he would rule next to his son Edward until he reached adulthood so that he can make decisions for him since he was only a child. But being a child king is anything but ideal children are very easily manipulated whoever controlled the king had control over the kingdom so many people wanted to take advantage of that but the queen elizabeth wasn't happy with the decision her late husband made the woodfills controlled the treasury the armory and also the navy and she was convinced that Richard wouldn't let them hold so much power and that he would leave them with nothing. The Woodfills had the majority of the royal council and they decided that Edward would start to rule immediately. Not with a protector by his side, his uncle, but with the council which was mostly the Woodville family so they would hold all the power. And they decided that Edward should return to London as fast as possible together with his uncle Anthony Woodville and also with an army to protect them so that they could crown him when he arrived. One of the former chamberlains of the late king, Lord Hastings, was an ally of Richard. He was also on the royal council and did not agree with the Woodfills. He informed Richard about the plans of the Woodfills. At first Richard was very loyal to the new king, but when he heard the news he was furious. The Woodfills refused his authority and the last wishes of the late king. And he wouldn't let them get away with it. And Queen Elizabeth thought she had everything under control. She made sure her younger son Richard was in her care. And of course her other son Edward was in the care of her brother Anthony. And he was on his way to London. At least that's what she thought. One day Anthony, the brother of the queen, received a letter to meet up with Richard halfway on his way to London. Richard wanted to show that they were all united and that they would go together to the coronation. But of course this was all a lie. Anthony agreed to it. He thought it was a very good idea. He had no idea what was gonna happen. He still thought that Richard was his friend and ally. Richard had always been loyal to his brother Edward IV, so Anthony thought he was still loyal to his family as well. While the other brother of Richard and of Edward IV, named George, was actually a traitor and he was even executed for high treason. So Richard was always the good brother. On the 30th of April 1483 at Stony Stratford, Richard and his ally the Duke of Buckingham had Anthony arrested and they took possession of the young king. He dismissed the young king's household and placed Anthony and Richard Grey in custody. When Queen Elizabeth heard about the news, she fled to Westminster Abbey for sanctuary together with her five daughters and her remaining son. She stayed there from spring until summer because she was deadly afraid of Richard. She was so scared of what he would do to her remaining son and to her daughters. And Richard came back with little Edward and he was recognized as the Lord Protector. So he was welcomed with open arms and he became the leader of the council and also the head of government. He made sure that preparations were being made for the coronation, but he also made sure that the coronation was being delayed over and over and over again. Richard escorted the young king to the Tower of London and you might think, oh my god, the Tower of London, that's a prison. But they also had royal residences there. So it was actually a place where the king would wait until he was crowned. And it happened all the time. So there was not a big alarm going off. 
it was very normal to bring the king to the Tower of London. Still, Richard was very afraid that his position wasn't strong enough to hold the power in the kingdom. At a chaotic meeting of the Royal Council on the 13th of June, he accused many councillors of treason. He thought they were conspiring against him. He arrested many people, including Lord Hastings, who actually told him about the Woodfills. But since he was a very good friend and ally to his brother Edward IV, he couldn't really risk that he would betray him. On June 16th, Richard also secured possession of the young Richard. He did so by claiming that Richard would attend his brother's coronation. Of course, this was all a lie and he reunited the princes in the tower and he wasn't planning on letting them go anytime soon or maybe even ever. He was now in control over the two princes and also their uncle Anthony Woodville and their half-brother Richard Grey. Richard couldn't let them live because they were a part of the Woodville family which were his enemies. They were executed for high treason on the 25th of June 1483. But this is not where the story ends. It even gets nastier. Because there were rumors that the princes and their sisters were all illegitimate. A preacher named Rolf Shah preached that the former king Edward IV had been secretly contracted to Eleanor Butler at the time of his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville. It is possible that this rumor was created to strengthen the claim of Richard and he would be the true heir to the throne. The Duke of Buckingham also made a speech denouncing the Woodvilles and showing his support to Richard. A northern army was also marching south to support Richard which caused a lot of panic. The three estates of England, which were noblemen, clergy and commons, were almost forced to unite against the princes. A few days after these events, the princes were pronounced illegitimate. Richard then claimed the throne for himself and usurped it on June the 26th. He was crowned together with his wife Anne at Westminster Abbey on July the 6th, 1483. He would be known as King Richard III. And while this all happened, the princes remained in the tower. A month before their uncle was crowned, all their attendants had been removed. And not much is known about their stay in the tower. They were seen in the gardens a few times. But over time, they were rarely seen behind bars and in the windows. It was almost like they disappeared. And eventually rumors started that the princes had been murdered, maybe even smothered with a feather bed or even poisoned. During the reign of Richard III, nobody could really find out what happened to the two princes. The king also didn't really have a reason to murder them. They were pronounced illegitimate, so they had no claim to the throne. And even their mother, Elizabeth Woodville, came back to court voluntarily in 1448, even with her daughters. Why would she do that if Richard had murdered her sons? She would put her daughters and even herself at risk. Then you also had Henry Tudor. Maybe he had something to do with the disappearance of the boys. He was the sole surviving male with any ancestral claim to the House of Lancaster, the rival of the House of York, which was the house of Richard III. He was raised in exile, but his supporters were always waiting for an opportunity to claim the throne for him. When Richard III usurped the throne, that chance came. Lancastrian supporters gathered an army and defeated Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. Even some supporters of Richard III, like the Stanleys, sided with Henry Tudor. A year after the battle, Henry was crowned Henry VII. He married the elder sister of the princess, Elizabeth of York. And this would unite the Red and White Rose and it would end the Wars of the Roses. This also made Henry's claim very strong. But this also meant that he had to make the children of Edward IV legitimate. Otherwise his wife would be illegitimate and he couldn't marry her. This also meant that the two princes had a far greater claim than he did. Maybe that's the reason why he could have made sure that they disappeared. He also ordered to kill many Yorkist heirs to strengthen his claim and to avoid a rebellion in the first year of his reign. But he was never accused of killing the boys, not even by his enemies. He also hardly spoke about it, but he made sure that people spread rumors about Richard's involvement. 
Some people think it's suspicious that Henry Tudor never talked about the boys, but they think he didn't speak about it because of political reasons, which makes sense. There were even some other suspects, but they didn't really have a lot of motive to kill the boys. The only person who also had a very good reason to kill the two princes was Margaret Beaufort and she was the mother of Henry Tudor. But she probably didn't have enough power to order their deaths in her position and as a woman. Whoever did it could live his life without any problems because nobody talked about it for a very long time. The bodies weren't found and there were even some theories that the boys had escaped. In Europe there was a boy who claimed to be Prince Richard. According to him he escaped the tower with the help of a powerful lord. He was so convincing that he earned a lot of support. Even from European princes the King of Scotland and Edward IV's sister Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy. It took Henry many years to capture the pretender prince and make him confess that he was actually Perkin Warbeck. He would have been from present day Belgium. And Perkin Warbeck was tortured to confess, so we don't know if everything he said was true. Many people lied when they were tortured because they just wanted it to stop. Anyway, the confession was enough for Henry Tudor and he ordered his execution. The order of death was made in October 1497 and Perkin Warbeck was hanged as a traitor in 1499. So the big threat was gone, Henry could rule without any problems, but the mystery of the prince's disappearance remains. Henry was done with pretenders and maybe that's the reason why Sir James Tyrrell made a very strange confession in 1502. Tyrrell was a condemned traitor and it's possible that he wanted to save his own skin. He claimed to have murdered the princess on Richard III's orders according to Thomas More who wrote this in his book History of King Richard III. During building work beside the White Tower, two bodies were discovered three meters beneath a staircase exactly where Sir James Tyrrell claimed to have buried the bodies of the princes. And since Thomas More wrote it down, it was very compelling to find it out because Thomas More was a well-respected man, so they really wanted to take a look into it. They found two human skeletons and they were proclaimed to be the ones of the two princes. In 1678 they were placed in a urn in Westminster Abbey. But not everybody was convinced because yes, Thomas More said they were buried there, but he also claimed that the bodies were taken to a better place. And they also found more skeletons, which also could be the skeletons of the princes. The story isn't over, because in 1933 they discovered even more. They decided to examine the bones. The bones and teeth were measured and it was concluded that the bones belonged to two children who were about the same ages as the princes. But there were still some questions, because they couldn't tell if the bodies were of females or of males. And they also couldn't tell how they died. They started a petition to test the DNA on the bones, but the petition was closed even before they reached their goal. But even if they could test the bones, they still wouldn't know how they were killed. And even if we go back to 1789, they found more coffins in St. George's Chapel. There was a small adjoining vault in the vault of Edward IV and Queen Elizabeth Woodville's vault. It contained coffins of two unidentified children. There were names inscribed on the tomb. George I, Duke of Bedford, who died at the age of two, and his sister Mary of York, who died when she was 14 years old. They were the children of Edward and Elizabeth and died before their father did. But two coffins with their names labeled on it were found somewhere else in the chapel. So they are not in the coffins within the vault. Of course, it could have been one of their other children. As I said before, they didn't really know for sure how many children they had. So maybe they had even more children and they were in the other coffins. In the late 1990s, work was being done near and around the tomb of Edward IV. And the interest of the disappearance of the princess was awoken. A request was being made to open the vault of the monarch but they had to have permission of the monarch that was reigning at that time, which was Elizabeth II. 
but she did not grant approval so the vault would remain closed and the mystery would remain unsolved. So to conclude it, this mystery is still a mystery. We still don't know if the bones were truly of the two boys. We still don't know who did it. We still don't know how they died. We still don't know if they might have survived. I do think that if they died, and I think that chance is very big, that Henry Tudor or Richard III had something to do with it or that they knew what happened. Uh, but we can't ask them anymore, so we can know for sure. Uh, I think the bodies that were found were of the princess. Uh, it's very peculiar that somebody said he buried them under the staircase and there were two bodies found of two little boys under the staircase. I think that says enough. But still, we don't know for sure. We don't really have the evidence. We only know for sure if they can find somebody who has the same DNA and they can test it. But as I said before, they can't open the vault. Is there enough evidence? Debatable. Do I think the evidence is strong? Yes. I'd like to know what you think. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And if you have any requests, put them in the comment section. And I hope to see you next time. And I promise it won't be nine months later. I'm gonna try my best to upload a video every month or maybe every three months if I really don't have a lot of time. But I'm back and I'm not going anywhere. Bye!